the consul. Mr. Pete was in a state of the liveliest exasperation. He had been in the consular service for more than twenty years, and he had had to deal with all manner of vexatious people, officials who would not listen to reason, merchants who took the British government for a debt-collecting agency, missionaries who resented as gross injustice any attempt at fair play. But he never recollected a case which had left him more completely at a loss. He was a mild-mannered man, but for no reason he flew into a passion with his writer, and he very nearly sacked the Eurasian clerk because he had wrongly spelt two words in a letter placed before him for his official signature. He was a conscientious man, and he could not persuade himself to leave his office before the clock struck four. The moment it did, he jumped up and called for his hat and stick. Because his boy did not bring them at once, he abused him roundly. They say that the consuls all grow a little odd, and the merchants who can live for thirty-five years in China without learning enough of the language to ask their way in the street say that it is because they have to study Chinese. And there was no doubt that Mr. Pete was decidedly odd. He was a bachelor, and on that account had been sent to a series of posts by which reason of their isolation were thought unsuited to married men. He had lived so much alone that his natural tendency to eccentricity had developed to an extravagant degree, and he had had habits which surprised the stranger. He was very absent-minded. He paid no attention to his house, which was always in great disorder, nor to his food. His boys gave him to eat what they liked, and for everything he had made him pay through the nose. He was untiring in his efforts to suppress the opium traffic, but he was the only person in the city who did not know that his servants kept opium in the consulate itself, and a busy traffic in the drug was openly conducted at the back door of the compound. He was an ardent collector, and the house provided for him by the government was filled with the various things which he had collected, one after the other, pewter, brass, carved wood. These were his more legitimate enterprises, but he also collected stamps, bird's eggs, hotel labels, and postmarks. He boasted that he had a collection of postmarks which was unequalled in the empire. During his long sojourning in lonely places, he had read a great deal, and though he was no sinologue, he had a greater knowledge of China, its history, literature, and people, than most of his colleagues. But from his wide reading, he had acquired not toleration, but vanity. He was a man of a singular appearance. His body was small and frail, and when he walked, he gave you the idea of a dead leaf dancing before the wind. And then there was something extraordinarily odd in the small Tyrolese hat, with a cock's feather in it, very old and shabby, which he wore perched rakishly on the side of his large head. He was exceedingly bald. You saw that his eyes, blue and pale, were weak behind the spectacles, and a drooping, ragged, dingy moustache did not hide the peevishness of his mouth. And now, turning out of the street in which was the consulate, he made his way onto the city wall, for there only, in the multitudinous city, was it possible to walk with comfort. He was a man who took his work hardly, worrying himself to death over every trifle, but as a rule a walk on the wall soothed and rested him. The city stood in the midst of a great plain, and often at sundown from the wall you could see in the distance the snow-capped mountains, the mountains of Tibet. But now he walked quickly, looking neither to the right nor the left, and his fat spaniel frisked about him unobserved. He talked to himself rapidly in a low monotone. The cause of his irritation was a visit that he had that day received from a lady who called herself Mrs. Yu, and whom he, with a consular passion for precision, insisted on calling Miss Lambert. This in itself sufficed to deprive their intercourse of amenity. She was an Englishwoman married to a Chinese. She had arrived two years before with her husband from England, where he had been studying at the University of London. He had made her believe that he was a great personage in his own country, and she had imagined herself to be coming to a gorgeous palace and a position of consequence. It was a bitter surprise when she found herself brought to a shabby Chinese house crowded with people. There was not even a foreign bed in it, nor a knife and fork. Everything seemed to her very dirty and smelly. It was a shock to find that she had to live with her husband's father and mother, and he told her that she must do exactly what his mother bade her. 
But in her complete ignorance of Chinese, it was not until she'd been two or three days in the house that she realized that she was not her husband's only wife. He'd been married as a boy before he left his native city to acquire the knowledge of the barbarians. When she bitterly upbraided him for deceiving her, he shrugged his shoulders. There was nothing to prevent a Chinese from having two wives if he wanted them. And he added, with some disregard to truth, no Chinese woman looked upon it as a hardship. It was upon making this discovery that she paid her first visit to the consul. He had already heard of her arrival. In China, everyone knows everything about everyone. And he received her without surprise. Nor had he much sympathy to show her. That a foreign woman should marry a Chinese at all filled him with indignation. But that she should do so without making proper inquiries vexed him like a personal affront. She was not at all the sort of woman whose appearance led you to imagine that she would be guilty of such a folly. She was a solid, thick-set young person, short, plain, and matter-of-fact. She was cheaply dressed in a tailor-made suit, and she wore a tam shanter She had bad teeth and muddy skin. Her hands were large and red and ill-cared for. You could tell that she was not unused to hard work. She spoke English with a cockney whine. "'How did you meet Mr. Yu?' asked the consul frigidly. "'Well, you see, it's like this,' um, she answered. "'Dad was in a very good position, and, and, and when he died, Mother said, "'Well, it seems a sinful ways to keep all those rooms empty. "'I'll put a card in the window.' "'The consul interrupted her. Um, "'He had lodgings with you?' "'Well, they weren't exactly lodgings,' she said. Uh, "'Shall we say apartments, then?' replied the consul with his thin, slightly vain smile. That was generally the explanation of his marriages. Then, because he thought her a very foolish, vulgar woman, he explained bluntly that according to English law she was not married to you, and that the best thing she could do was to go back to England at once. She began to cry, and his heart softened a little to her. He promised to put her in charge of some missionary ladies who would look after her on the long journey, and indeed, if she liked, he would see if, meanwhile, she could not live in one of the missions. But while he talked, Miss Lambert dried her tears. "'What's the God in going back to England?' she said at last. "'I haven't got nowhere to go.' "'You can go to your mother.' She was all against my marrying, Mr. Yu. I should never hear the last of it if I was to go back now. The consul began to argue with her, but the more he argued, the more determined she became, and at last he lost his temper. If you like to stay here with a man who isn't your husband, it's your own lookout, but I wash my hands of all responsibility. Her retort had often wrangled. Then you got no cause to worry, she said, and the look on her face returned to him whenever he thought of her. That was two years ago, and he had seen her once or twice since then. It appeared that she'd gone on very badly with her mother-in-law and with her husband's other wife, and she had come to the consul with preposterous questions about her rights according to Chinese law. He repeated his offer to get her away, but she remained steadfast in her refusal to go, and their interview always ended in the consul's flying into a passion. He was almost inclined to pity the rascally you who are to keep the peace between these three warring women. According to his English wife's account, he was not unkind to her. He tried to act fairly by both his wives. Miss Lambert did not improve. The consul knew that ordinarily she wore Chinese clothes, but when she came to see him, she put on European dress. She was become extremely blousy. Her health suffered from the Chinese food she ate, and she was beginning to look wretchedly ill. But really he was shocked when she had been shown into his office that day. She wore no hat, and her hair was dishevelled. She was in a highly hysterical state. They're trying to poison me, she screamed, and she put before him a bowl of some foul-smelling food. It's poisoned, she said. I've been ill for the last ten days. It's only by a miracle I've escaped. She gave him a long story, circumstantial and probable enough, enough to convince him. After all, nothing was more likely than that the Chinese women should use familiar methods to get rid of an intruder who was hateful to them. D do they know you come here? Of course they do. I told them I was going to show them up. Now at last was the moment for decisive action. The consul looked at her in his most official manner. Well, you must never go back there. 
I refuse to put up with your nonsense any longer. I insist on your leaving this man who isn't your husband. But he found himself helpless against the woman's insane obstinacy. He repeated all the arguments he had used so often, but she would not listen, and as usual he lost his temper. It was then, in the answer to his final desperate question, that she had made the remark which had entirely robbed him of his calm. But what on earth makes you stay with the man? he cried. She hesitated for a moment, and a curious look came into her eyes. There's something in a way his hair grows on his forehead that I can't help liking, she answered. The consul had never heard anything so outrageous. It really was the last straw. And now, while he strode along, trying to walk off his anger, though he was not a man who often used bad language, he really could not restrain himself, and he said fiercely, Women are simply bloody!'